Hello, I'm Simon Walton, MD and founder of Eiffel Presentations. Uh, this is the latest of our In Conversation videos where we get together with friends, colleagues and customers to chat through all things presentations. I am so pleased to have Caroline Goida join us um, for this In Conversation video. Caroline uh, is the author of a number of brilliant books. We'll talk about those in more detail shortly. Um, and I had the great pleasure of working alongside Caroline for a shared customer uh, and a campaign and a program that we ran. But I won't go into that detail. I'll let Caroline introduce herself properly and let's talk about some of the stuff we've done together. Caroline, who are you? What do you do? And just give us a little bit of background. Oh, well, hi, Simon. It's great to be here. In a nutshell, I'm someone who struggled to find her voice. When I left university and went to drama school, they said, you have no presence, you have no <laughs> resonance. I felt breathy, I blushed, I went blank. And over the last 20 plus years, which dates me somewhat, I've had to learn how to unpick what it means to find your voice and find your presence. And if I can do it, anybody can, because my TED talk has been watched 8.2 million and rising times. So I'm a kind of rags to riches story when it comes to starting out not a good speaker and then learning to be one. I love the fact that you've you've experienced that awful feeling of you've got no presence, you yeah, you, you like you said the body revolts against the opportunity to speak, all of those horrible things. Uh and you've has somehow managed to not only harness that, but tame it and, and and make the most of it and turn it into a very successful career. So um, we got to, we met, um, we're supporting uh, our friends at Adobe with a really important uh, sort of program they run uh, for women in marketing. Um, and I know you're particularly passionate about helping uh, more female speakers get up on stage or get up in front of a webcam these days and deliver with passion and conviction uh, their message. Because you're seeing this and I see it myself with, with the, the clients that we work with, there is this reticence for female leaders to step up there and 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 be counted and present in in you know, in the forums that are available to them why do you think that is i know it's the phenomenon of manals isn't it that we've heard of where you you have a, a panel with three men and no women and the the thing that organizers will tell you and producers of tv shows will tell you is that they ask equal numbers of men and women and what they will say is way more women than men say no when invited to speak. Now, I'm not someone who likes to gender things. You know, I work with men and women in the same way, but I think there sometimes is a reticence that a woman, even though she may be a world-class scientist, might say, oh, I don't know enough to speak on that <laughs> panel. And, and actually, that's not true, is it? It's because she doesn't feel equipped to speak. And so what we've been doing with this fab Adobe program is helping women to feel equipped to speak. And that's the stories that they tell, that's their voice and body language, that's how they calm themselves, it's how you prep. It's so simple, that's the thing. Yeah, it's, uh, it, I think it's such a, an important programme and I hope, you know, sort of people kind of catch on to the fact that, you know, uh, organisations like Adobe and their compatriots can, can get out there and actually start prompting people to come up with coping mechanisms or whatever it might be, just go through the process that you've shared to uh, to allow them to step up and uh, and have their voice heard which i think is, is really important that is a wonderful segue if you don't mind me saying to uh your books uh finding your voice you see what i did there it's almost like i prepared fantastic books and i um and they're slightly moth-eaten and apologies for that because i've had a, a good old sort of rummage through and there are a number of things in them that i'm really keen to explore if you don't mind one I kind of punched the air a little bit. It was like, yes, finally somebody's talking about this stuff, which is, uh, we call it outcome-based presenting, which is, what's the purpose of your presentation? And I don't see enough written about, actually, a presentation is about driving a response and action from your audience. Too many people focus on, the, on things like slides or... And, and quite rightly, things like story structure and body language and all of the, all of those component parts, but they never quite sort of uh, tie them together and go, get all of these things right, and you then drive an action. You drive a response from your audience. But you're very passionate about that. Talk me through what you, how you, you can see people doing that better and what they should be looking to, to do going forward. 
So, I mean, this matters, doesn't it? Because why speak to an audience, as you say, if you don't move them from A to B? And my background is theatre. So in theatre, an actor has an objective and you get on stage and you want to do something physically to the other person. That's, that's what powers you on stage. And, you know, a speech, a presentation, a panel is a kind of performance. And if you're not changing people, why bother? Send it as a PDF, send it as an email. And if you want to change something, you've got to know what that is. So I always reverse engineer presentations. The first thing I'll say to a speaker is, where do you want to get the audience to? What are they going to say about this when you finish? What are they going to do differently? How are they going to feel? And it's totally logical when you think about it. You do just have to do that reverse engineering. You're absolutely right. We, we talk a lot about message, as you know. We, we've talked long and hard about this. And and one of my frustrations is that people don't tend to focus enough on crafting the message to drive the action. They just dive straight into content. And so all of the things we hear about death by PowerPoint and all, all of the things that are out there, death by PowerPoint happens because there's too much content. It's not because the slides aren't pretty enough or any of that stuff. It's because you're throwing too much content, irrelevant content, at an audience. And so they leave confused. Or they just get very bored very quickly and they switch off. The net result of that is that they won't take action. There's a, I don't know if you've ever come across a, an author called Leela Fever. Um, really, really well, well worth sort of dipping into some of his books. And I wish I'd come up with this quote myself, but he, he beat me to it. But it sums it up perfectly, which is confused people never take action. Oh, I love it. It's good, isn't it? Really good. And it's just like one of those things where you go, that's it. That's why you've got to put the hard work in to defining what is it you want your audience to do, what message do you want them to remember, and then you go to your content and figure out what you need to be picking out and how you structure it, how you deliver it, and all of those things. But you can't do any of that stuff until you've done the really unsexy bit, which is working really hard to define what your message is and the action that you need to, to get across. And it's not glamorous, is it? That's hard work. It's funny, one of the things I say to people is it's, it's not glamorous, but actually it doesn't have to feel arduous in the sense that I love the idea, there's a chap called Kirk Vallis at Google who talks about the slow hunch. And I love the idea that you put into the computer of your brain the question, where do I want to get the audience to and how am I going to get them there? And then you go for a walk with the dog or you sit and relax on a Sunday morning and you just let ideas come slowly. And that process, if you give yourself enough time before the event to have slow hunches and capture them on post-its or on a computer document, actually can be quite a relaxed process. It's a human process. The, the thing that people have to give themselves is planning time. You have to reverse engineer your diary and you have to give yourself creative space. And I think the thing that people do, as you have said, Simon, is that they go straight to the deck or they write the paper. And that's fine if you're doing an exam, but it's useless preparation if you're speaking, because speaking is about feelings and bodies and voices and ears, not about just brains. I think there's a big cultural thing as well. And I, I see it within our own business. I, yeah, we, we've got uh, story consultants. And the best advice I can share with them, outside of yeah, various store, proven story structures that work, is give yourself a break you will not come up with that, that sort of moment of genius staring at your laptop you know, for hours on end. Like you say, take the dog for a walk, do anything that's not thinking about that and you guarantee it will suddenly pop in your brain. My greenhouse has been the, the, the place where I've come up with some of the best stuff we've ever done, done for customers and I feel guilty for being in there fiddling around with, with the plants, but that's when the magic happens. And it's peculiar. I love the, the concept of the slow hunch. That's really nice. So, so uh, yeah, that outcome-based presenting, driving that forward, I think is, 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 is really, really powerful. But then the actual delivery of that, I think, is another sort of uh, important part of the process, a vital part of the process. And uh, you've touched on it already, but the confidence, that finding confidence as a speaker and a presenter yeah, uh, we've talked previously about authenticity and the importance of making sure that you believe in what you're saying, not just sort of, you know, you're not reading a script. So you're not, 
you're not sort of phoning it in you've got to truly believe in this and there's a large chunk of that in in your books which is how do i make the most of this engagement and truly deliver it as 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 a an authentic person Just expand a little bit on on some of that confidence uh in building that confidence through that oh absolutely this thing of confidence and embodied presence is massive for speaking so where we get it wrong is that we think speaking and writing are the same. Maybe because at school there's no separation and we think that we learn to speak in the same way we learn to write. So if I want to write something, I, I write an essay. Now, the way people transfer that file is that they write a speech and then they try and learn it or then they try and go on stage with it and oh my gosh, it's hard to be on stage with a piece of paper and your hand is shaking and you're trying to read it. <laughs> and it takes most people straight back to the classroom. And most people didn't have a great experience reading aloud in class. So I, I like many speaker coaches, I'm the person who prizes speeches out of people's hands and says, tell me the headlines. What do you want to say? What would you say if you could say anything? Okay, let's record that, let's listen back. What are the key words? What are the things that you absolutely have to say? Right, those are your signposts. Let's practice how you get from signpost A to signpost B. Let's practice your end. And then what happens is that people can show up on stage speaking, not remembering something like an essay. And suddenly you see a human being, not a computer, and although it's not perfect, they might trip over words a little bit, they might not say it quite the way they wanted to, the audience don't care. The audience don't want perfection, they want a human. Thinking, speaking, breathing in front of them. And imperfection on stage, as long as you're prepped, is actually quite appealing, because perfection is a bit boring, truth be told. I, I love that. I, we, we support people in what we call our, our soft skills sort of courses. And we kind of, <laughs> it, it doesn't always work for everybody because I'm firmly of the opinion that if you're worrying more about what you're doing with your hands than what you're engaging, communicating with your audience, you've, you've lost the plot. This is about that building that connection. And I am, I break every, I, I, yeah, I sort of, as a presenter, I break every rule. I do a lot of presenting and you know, thankfully a lot of the feedback is pretty positive, but I trip over my words all the time. I'm doing it now and I'm, I'm, my hands are flying all, all over the place, but that's because I'm excited and passionate about what we're talking about. And if I played it truly professionally, God, it'd be boring, wouldn't it? Like you say, really, really. Um. But technology is a really interesting thing. You, you touched on it there of just talk to me about what you want to say and using a phone um, to record that, transcribing that, which is super easy these days. And then you go, oh, wow, okay. I've suddenly got the, the basis of, of what I want to say. Now I can start engaging um, yeah, with the, the audience based on, on quality content, not just, as you say, that, that sort of that, that script that's been written um, to be read rather than to, to actually yeah, listen to and engaged and, and to be delivered. Um, technology is very is a, is a key part of what we're doing these days, having to re present remotely. Talk me through some of the shifts you've had to, to sort of put in place with your customers to help them engage better more you know, via this remote situation we find ourselves in. Well, I mean, Simon, I have to be honest, I have been on a very steep learning curve this year because I will freely admit that I am not a tech native. And in fact, back in March, it was all really so new to me. But because I was running a lot of um, you know, sessions that would have been face to face, like Henley Business School, suddenly they were online in April. And so I had a steep learning curve. And, and one of the big lessons that I have been passing on to speakers everywhere, because it was so helpful to me, was something that Henley said, which is the profs who are teaching online will tell you that the most important thing you can do is stand up because it helps your alignment, it helps your breathing, it helps your gesture, and it gives you confidence. And I know that that's something that you do as well. So. It, that for me was the steepest learning curve but then it's really also important to learn about background and lighting and there's a lovely model that Duarte teach I know you're a Duarte fan as well which is lambs 
which is lighting, audio, me, uh, background, and then speed. And those five things, if you think about them, are a really good basis for a, a basic level of professionalism on this medium, which is really important. Yeah, it, it, it is. And I think people have got over that initial reticence of, of doing this. Yeah, I'd much prefer us to be sat with a, a cup, cup of coffee, shooting the breeze, yeah, in the same room. Ain't going to happen for a while. And what we've got to, I think people are now getting their head around the fact that you can um, build a, a, a strong relationship. Yeah, we've never met in person, but we can have a, a yeah, free-flowing conversation because um, you kind of look beyond the technology now. And I think that you're absolutely right. Put the prep in. It's absolutely vital that, that, that you follow those rules and that you make sure the washing isn't behind you and all that, all of that sort of stuff. You know, and uh, we've all heard some horrific stories of things going horribly wrong on that side. And then kind of in the nicest way, forget the technology. Um, in one of our previous In Conversation videos, we were working with a, a client that has had to deliver a really important pitch to part of the, the NHS completely remotely. And they were, uh, it was a, a two-handed presentation and uh, the two people presenting were 100 miles away from each other. It's a completely different you know, sort of uh, game. However, once you've put those basics in place, it is still about sharing a story with an audience in a way that will engage and drive action. Let's take it right back to yeah, its, its core components. And you've got to do all the right things, but but don't, don't overcompensate because the technology is there. Actually just harness it and, and make the most of it is, is, is my experience at least. And I think people say, oh, I can't read the room on tech. And actually I'm pushing back on that a lot at the moment. It's more our attention that is the problem and we're distracted on tech. So the thing that you can do and that I have to do before something like this is what I would do before going on stage, get really present and centered, get your attention sharp as anything, like you're gonna play tennis, and then you can read the tech, you can read people through the screen. You're absolutely right. And there are diverge, there have been sort of distractions and diversions for the last, certainly five years, if not longer. Yeah, you're speaking at a large conference, everyone's on their phone. You've, they're, they're already, you know, you're still fighting for their attention. The way you do that is by making sure that what you deliver to them is valuable to them because they could be in the same room. Yeah, I'm, I've certainly experienced it. I'm sure most people have where it could be a relatively small meeting and there might be somebody that's on their phone because what you're sharing isn't relevant to them. And you've got to factor that into the way that, that, that things work. In conclusion, then, I'm going to ask you um, just your simple, your best hack something that the viewers of this video can apply immediately to improve the quality of their delivery or the story they're telling, whatever element of presentations that you think is most relevant. What is it that you would share uh, with that audience? The thing that makes a big difference to speakers is very, very simple, and it's called camera out. In our home office tech COVID land, we're often quite stuck in our heads because we're in email, we're on Slack, Facebook, whatever, and it becomes very headbound. And then our attention tends to be locked internally. We're thinking thoughts, we're telling ourselves a story. What that does to you as a speaker is it makes you a bit flat. It, you kind of get this energy and you can see someone thinking about themselves as they speak. It's really bad for presence. Just like if you were running out to play tennis or running out onto the rugby field, go camera out, get into your peripheral nervous system. My feet are on the floor. The air is on my face. I can see the sun in the window. I can see Simon smiling. That peripheral nervous system allows you to really get centered and present. And then people will pay attention to you because your attention is out there with them rather than stuck in your own head. And it's like the feeling of giving someone a hug. It's a kind of out there feeling rather than a locked in feeling. And I think we've all been a bit locked in for a year. So the more you can get that feeling of a hug, camera out, the more you're gonna engage people. And that applies just as much to tech as it does to the real world if we ever get back on a stage again. We will. 
pretty damn sure we will. So that's, yeah. Carol, it's always such a lovely, lovely sort of uh, time chatting with you and just, yeah, sort of, you're as, as passionate and as, as full of ideas as, as, as anybody that I speak to in our sector. So thank you so much. Uh, I'll, I'll plug your books because I know you're, you're being too polite not to, but uh, they are really, really good. Gravitas is, um, is a book that I, I really loved because it was about driving action. It was doing all of the things that makes, that stops presenters doing stuff fully and embracing the opportunity we talk about a lot you and i have about the privilege of presenting it's such a wonderful opportunity grab it with both hands but but knowing that actually um having the, those elements in place is absolutely key find your voice i loved it's it's it, it, this this is kind of like your your the journey that you've been on as well I, um and your ted talk I can't believe there aren't many people that haven't seen the TED Talk, but if they haven't, they've got to check it out. It's so, so good. Um, and yeah, thank you again for, for sharing your time and, and your wisdom and your experience as well, because it's I know this is going to be really valuable. Thank you so much. I always love chatting to you. I think we, we come at this from different angles, but we're very much on the same page where we get to. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. And one day, coffee or a glass of wine or wherever it might be, but we'll definitely get there. It's on. See you there. Fantastic. <laughs> You take care, eh? See you soon. Thanks again so much. Really appreciate it.